Okay, can you see me there? All good. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I did my, um, my study, my MSc on the population of Marshall Eagles in the Kruger National Park. And this was in 2022, so it's been now a year since, year and a half since my field work. And I spent the whole of last year writing up and then managed to submit in February now. So yeah, happy that's over and lucky to move back to the low felt. So just a breakdown on, on getting started. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the Marshall Eagle project in Kruger and why it was first started. And then some of the observations from the field season, just interesting interactions with species. And then get on to the effects of climate on the foraging, which was my particular focus for my MSc. All right, so the Marshall Eagle is the largest African eagle. There is obviously a crowned eagle who is slightly stronger and maybe a little bit bigger, but um, the, the Marshall male is about 3.3 kgs and the, the female is about 4.7 kgs. So already you can see there's a large size distinction between the two, although they have a very similar plumage, so it's quite difficult to tell the two apart unless they're standing right next to one another. And you can also see that the juvenile, this is still a chick, uh, is that white plumage uh, with a little bit of uh, black speckling on the back, whereas the female and the male have that speckles on the, on the belly, as well as the um, brown chest, brown back. And the, the, eye, the, the eyes are slightly different. You see bright yellow eyes and that black eyes on the juvenile, the chick. As they're getting slightly older, you see that uh, the immature bird going into sub-adult plumage starts to have a little bit of speckles, uh, but it's, it's an intermediate, can be confusing with a, a couple of other species. Um, yeah. So the last thing is that they are territorial, they are monogamous, so they do breed for life until one of the partners disappear over time. And they do hold a very strong territory, so uh, we'll get into their territory size. And then generally they have one egg every two years, but it's a little bit complicated. Some areas have higher quality habitat, and they might actually produce an egg every year, but in general here in the Kruger, they tend to have one egg every two years. So in other regions like uh, Masai Mara, Kenya, uh, habitat quality might be a little bit better. There might be slightly more prey available for them or the climate might be better or more suitable to then produce every year. It also depends on whether they have a male chick or a, a female chick. The male chick tends to be smaller and fledges after only about 90 days, whereas the female takes an extra 20 days and a lot more food is required for them. So a lot more effort goes in from the adults to then produce a female chick. So they're more likely to then miss a year and, and go in the following two years. All right, so they occur throughout sub-Saharan Africa, uh, all the way down to the Karoo in the Cape. And they have estimated roughly about 800 pairs, uh, but that was back in 2015. And that's currently being worked on at the moment, and I think the next IUCN update is due by the end of the year. Uh, but that's just in South Africa, Lesotho, and Swaziland. Unfortunately, there are a number of threats and um, threats to their sustainable population, including habitat loss. Um, obviously, throughout Africa, there's a, a high drive for fuel, and fuel comes in the form of, of wood, and that's their habitat that they rely on. Uh, so habitat loss is a major issue, not only for them, but also for their prey species. And then persecution for the muti trade, as well as problem animal control, uh, they are the ultimate killers, really. And they, yeah, I won't go too bad into that, but uh, chickens don't do well around them. <laughs> and not, neither do goats and yeah, anything small and furry. Uh, so then also electrocution and collision on, on power line um, infrastructure as well as renewable energy development is a big issue. Um, they don't do well around turbines and although they don't do well on electrocution in the Karoo they actually breed on power line infrastructure. So yeah, it's, some places they don't do well and other places they're doing incredibly well. Um, and then their biology, it's not a threat, but obviously breeding very slow, living at low density, um, yeah, low density areas, um, it means that if, they are, if you're losing individuals, you're more likely to have a problem in your population or population decline from that. All right, so when, we, when they first looked at it, so there are a number of people who were involved in this project in the past. I was only involved in 2022 and 23. So there are you know, more people um, historically. So when they first decided that they were going to look into marshals in the Kruger, they first, it's very loud, 
I'll talk a little bit further away. Um, okay, so as long as you can all hear, I guess. So they first looked into the SABAP2. Um, so SABAP is the Southern African Bird Atlas Project. And basically on your phones, you'll have the Bird Lassa app. And as you go around throughout Southern, Southern Africa, or actually throughout Africa, you're able to then record species in different areas. And you see all these small little squares on the right-hand side. Um, each of those squares are a single pentad. And as you go into that pentad, you spend an hour in the pentad and you record whether that bird is in the pentad or not. So you get what you call a reporting rate. Uh, it's the number of times you see the bird in the pentad uh, over the number of times that anyone was even in the pentad. So it's a good proxy for population um, size, effectively, and whether the birds are in the pentad or not. So you see that only, only a few of the pentads are coming up in red. So it shows that the birds are definitely present in the area. And there's quite a few greens and quite a few blues. So that all looks great. And then we ended up comparing it with the SAPAP-1 protocol, which was done from 19, was the 1980s to the 1990s. And when you compare the, the two, you see that there's actually been a bit of a decline uh, in the population. So a lot of those squares are no longer showing uh, the same presence of marshals. Uh, but there is a little bit of a, um, a, a problem with this. You shouldn't take it for face value. Um, it's all relative on the amount of roads that you have in an area as well as the, the number of birds um, in the area. And I guess uh, each species reacts differently to being seen. So this is a, a low density bird that's quite, um, uh, not hidden, but yeah, hard to find. So anyway, take it as it is. And that's why they then decided, based on this, there might be a population decline. And let's figure out why there's a population decline. All right, so they started off with a citizen science project by fitting satellite tracking devices to the birds, uh, to birds that they caught in the Kruger, as well as putting color rings and saff rings on their legs. So you see here, you've got green A3, which is probably the most famous eagle in the whole of South Africa, in my opinion. Uh, it was down in Lower Sabi, so if anyone's driven the Lower Sabi, they might have actually seen this bird sitting in a tree with a, generally a leg of uh, in the tree. And then there's obviously the, the email address that they were able, you're able to send those sightings through to. And the satellite tracking device was, was really good at being able to tell you what habitat they're using, how large their territories are, so we can start painting a picture of how many we have in the Kruger to start with. And that goes on to show you that once, we're, once we found uh, where that bird was nesting, you, yeah, we, we were able to say that uh, most of the birds showed about 100 kilometers squared territory. So based on their movements within the territory, you get an average size of a territory size. And then you start pinning different nests to then get uh, your collage. And obviously, if you look in the middle of all five of those um, nest territories, then theory should be a nest in the middle of that. Easier said than done. Um, there's no roads there, and that's, I think that's upwards of five kilometers walk through the bush to randomly hit a nest in a little tree somewhere. So, um, yeah, not, not so simple, but the, the idea was that you need to understand how many um, territories you have in the Kruger first, how many are active, and how many breeding birds you have, and then also how many um, floating birds. So you see on the, the right-hand side, there's an adult that's actually holding down a sub-adult or a juvenile, and those floating <coughs> birds are always sitting around the edges of the territories, waiting for an opportunity to get into a territory if there's a vacancy. All right. All right. Thank you, Carl. Okay, so I had a couple of questions uh, for my MSC in particular. The one was, does climate influence prey provisioning and prey composition? And that was the crux of my MSC. Uh, there was a number of other questions, which, what factors influence reproductive success? And then, does habitat qu quality influence prey composition? So to go about it first, I then started looking for nests. So we had 136 known nests plus another 100 or so nests that they had found on a survey, on an aerial survey. And I've walked around Kruger for eight months just looking for every nest possible and hopefully they were active. And we actually had out of the 136, I think only 24 were active. So it was a lot of walking to empty nests. 
But then occasionally I would actually find a nest just driving around. So as I drove around, just head swiveling, looking for anything large in the top of a tree, and hopefully it's a marshal nest. Uh, if it was, then I'd walk up and I had a long extendable pole that could go up to about 15, 20 meters, and a GoPro on the top, and I'd extend the pole up there until I can then see onto the nest, and that's the best idea of what if the nest is actually active. So you'd find that uh, the nest would be large and it would have a lot of either dead leaves or nice fresh green leaves. And if there were fresh green leaves, I then climb the tree and I would install a camera trap um, facing the nest so that I could then monitor, well the camera would then monitor uh, for the duration of the season. Oh, just going on to the, the tree species that they use, sorry. Um, knob thorn, uh, leadwood and uh, apple blah, um, marula and mapani and jackalberry and weeping bourbon. Um, yeah, so it's a wide variety of trees. There's no particular preference for a tree species, whether it's a thorn tree. I mean, a lot of raptors breed in thorn trees for protection and safety, uh, but these guys don't seem to use that method of, of uh, uh, evolution, I guess, looking after your nest using a thorn tree. Um, rather, they just build a large nest and hopefully no one finds their nest or no one climbs to try and uh, yeah, um, get rid of them. So yes, as I said, there's dead leaves and then you get to your nice green leaves and actually there's, a, there's an egg in that one, followed by a green, green leaves with a chick and then a larger chick. So it, with every nest was slightly different, uh, but obviously interesting to tell what's inside there. Sometimes there would be an adult sitting on the nest and you wouldn't know from the bottom. They lie very low and very flat and those nests are big enough for me to stand and even sit inside and it's not a problem and uh, quite deep as well. So a whole adult who is, I mean, so high um, can hide away inside there. And obviously it's good to see what kind of food they're bringing, but I wasn't focusing too much, but there seems to be a slender mongoose and a little, I think it's a crested Franklin uh, next to the one chicken over there. And yeah, thanks. And you click one more time. So this is just once when we arrived and we, uh, uh, anyway, uh, and then I was able to put the camera up and see that the little chicken is now actually hatched and it's about five days old at this point and floundering around um, and at that point I'm happy to climb, the, uh, climb up to the nest and put the camera trap. Uh, if there's an egg I tend to leave the nest alone because that adult needs to come back and then incubate the egg and I don't want to um, allow the sun to you know, cause any damage to the egg and so. Uh, but once the chick's there it's, it's not a problem, uh, you take a little sprig of green leaves and you just put it over the chick while he sits there, just to give him some shade. Ta. All right, so just an idea of where we were working. So I didn't actually work any further than about Shinguetsi. I didn't touch the, the north, north region. Uh, but as I said, that started off with about 136 nests that we, that we know of, and then moved to um, putting up camera traps on, we only managed to put up camera traps at 36 of the nests over the five year period. And of the 36, uh, only 14 actually had successful chicks that I could then use for my study. And of those, only 12 of them actually had sufficient data from them. So really whittled down, it's, it was a lot more challenging than I imagined to, to get successful nests and prey data. All right, but once we get we did get the pictures, um, there was sure over I want to say is a huge amount, seven hundred, so one hundred and fifty thousand camera trap images, image by image, um, which was insane to go through. But we ended up with about thousand and eighty uh, prey items that were recorded, and that was one image by one image, and then obviously, hopefully, you can then identify what the prey item actually is. So you see on the top left, you've got a water monitor, long thin tail with the, the nice bands across it. Um, there's a diker or a bushbuck, uh, I, I didn't double check that, but I think it's a bushbuck, um, getting fed to the chick there. Uh, there's rock monitor um, being delivered there, and a banded mongoose, or dwarf mongoose, one of the two. Sorry, it's been a, bit, uh, a couple of years since I looked at that. Um, but anyway, hopefully they're easy enough to identify. Um, it is quite useful having large prey items delivered to the nest. Um, often what happens with smaller species, they deliver very small prey items and they devour it within seconds and you don't get any idea of 
what they're feeding on. Whereas these large items can stay on the nest for hours and hours before they're actually eaten. Uh, I mean, and then obviously those water monitors or legovans, those tails remain on the nest for up to two months, three months afterwards, and slowly just rot and go into the nest when the next sticks are brought on. So those nests are just filled to the brim with old bones uh, that are just you know, built into it, basically. So, yeah, there was, as I said, 36 prey species that were recorded in the diet, and most of them were birds. Um, mammals, 33%, and reptiles, 21%. But the majority of the birds being helmeted guinea fowls, uh, swains and spur fowl, and crested franklin. And there's actually chicken there. So down in, where was it, in um, Pretorius Cop, there was a, a nest quite close to the cut line. And this male would disappear off over into the farmlands. And I had the, the camera on him for probably about 70 days. And he brought back 46 chickens in 70 <laughs> days. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So he was doing a good job over there, uh, which also, yeah, we'll talk about what happens with that afterwards. Uh, it's quite unusual to be going through the camera looking at these and I could not work out what they were. They're not Spurfowl and they're not Franklin and, and then I realized uh, they're little chickens. Uh, so yeah, um, then the, the mongoose, they tend to forage a lot on mongoose, dwarf, slender, banded, and then savannah hares a big portion. And obviously the main one there, the largest one anyway, is rock monitor. Um, they do forage on, on Nile monitor as well, but far less, and that's obviously habitat dependent where there's, they're close to large river bodies, um, particularly down on the Crocodile River, there was one pair that was just bringing Nile monitors the whole time. I think they ran out towards the midway through the season though, so they started bringing rocks after that. And yeah, so anyway, that's the, the breakdown there. But it's interesting that out of 36 species of, of prey items, the top 10 make up 85% of their diet. So they're really capable of catching almost everything, but they really focus on particular well, particular species. Maybe it's an abundance um, thing, or maybe it's habitat quality, uh, but we're, yeah, we'll jump into that now. All right, so this, uh, I put this there for uh, Dr. Carl, and uh, soon to be Dr. Fee at some point, and Dr. Carey at some point as well, and this is for all those doctors out there who uh, are interested in this. So I had some stats involved, um, it was, uh, I learned a lot. Uh, but I did multiple ge generalized linear mixed models with binomial distributions and logit link functions. And I used, uh, for the explanatory variables, I used um, the hour of the day, the temperature, the rainfall, and whether it was a male or female who brought uh, a prey item. And I was basically looking at if that would then show a prediction of uh, how prey, uh, how often or whether the, the probability of a prey item actually being delivered to the nest across the temperature spectrum. Anyway, very poorly described to you, but anyway, that's ticked now. And I did have a little bit of temperature data which I received from Kruger. So they've got uh, temperature sensors around Kruger and I took their data uh, and put it into an hourly or into a daily format where I was using the highest temperature of the day as the main, as the daytime temperature. So the, obviously the low periods I was using the, the lowest or the highest temperature for the day. Thanks. Okay, so first I looked at the prey probabilities. So this is slightly further on from the first one, but I like to split it up into males and females. So the females being the red line here, and this is just the probability of a female delivering a prey item to the nest across the temperature spectrum. So obviously when it's a very cold day, uh, 10 degrees Celsius, the likelihood of a, of, a, of a female provisioning a prey item is almost zero. And slowly it moves up to about 25% when the temperatures are roughly 30 degrees and then back down to almost zero at about 45 degrees, which is very interesting. You can really tell that's like biology wise, uh, the female should be on the nest protecting the chick from excessive sunlight in the afternoon time, as well as uh, in the morning time when it's cold, they'll be on the nest and then keeping the chick warm. So the female's really nest bound. Whereas the male is out there day in and day out for four months solid, just bringing back food. Uh, he doesn't feed the chick at all. He only arrives on the nest, drops it, and then leaves. And she then takes it and, and then uh, gives it to the, the chick. So you see that he has a 75% probability of bringing prey items uh, on a colder day, 
but he also drops significantly as the temperature increases down to about 50% um, probability of that prey item. Um, but when it's very hot, he's also likely going to be standing in the shade um, under a tree keeping cool or it's a factor of the, the prey themselves are struggling to then forage or be active and so on. So it's hard to tease that apart, but um, you can see there's obviously something happening with temperature. Thanks. All right, so when we broke it down into the actual prey phylum themselves and you were looking at birds, mammals and reptiles, it starts off again. Um, birds being the most uh, likely to come in during the, the, the medium temperature days, that 25, 20 to 25 maximum, um, but it does drop off as temperatures get a lot hotter, uh, almost down to zero uh, from 40 degrees onwards, which is problematic. Uh, but the, the, the mammals themselves tend to be quite stable throughout. Obviously mammals deal with uh, temperatures a lot more um, easily and they're suitable all the way across. Although there was a change from smaller mammals um, in the colder days towards larger mammals in the, in the hotter days. Uh, so that was interesting. And then reptiles, which makes a lot of sense, are not active um, when it's cold, but as soon as it heats up, then the reptiles are active. But they also reach their critical maximum towards the, the 40 degrees and they start sloping off. So everything seems, they do seem to, to struggle to bring in prey towards that very hot time, uh, time period. Alright, so again I looked at a sex-based diet niche separation, which is basically, I told you that males and females are slightly different sizes. No, vastly different sizes, uh, 4.7 4 to 3.3, .3, which is really useful because now if you're focusing on one prey type or one prey group, uh, you're able to allow females to hunt larger prey and males to hunt slightly smaller prey. And you can see that very clearly there that they are hunting larger prey, these females, uh, and in general males smaller. But both are affected um, by the maximum temperature of the day. So they are bringing in, but they're not negatively affected. They, they're bringing in larger prey items as temperatures increase. So that speaks about uh, rock monitors being slightly heavier than a, a, a Franklin or a Spurfile, so, uh, as well as larger mammals that they're bringing in. Okay, so temperature influences prey probability but not prey biomass. And I thought that was a very interesting one because if they're not bringing in prey uh, at all, or it's going down, they're bringing in less prey, then surely the amount of uh, biomass goes down and the chick is then receiving less food, which is very problematic for the development of the chick. But it seems, as said, that they actually bring in heavier food. So they're able to compensate, and it's through compensating with the three different prey phylums that they're able to do that. If there wasn't um, large reptiles, for instance, uh, during the hottest periods of the day, they would really be struggling to bring in a lot of food during those hot days. Obviously climate change is a real issue these days and the, the temperatures are getting hotter and hotter, so these birds have to adapt. And in this case, in the Kruger in particular, they are able to adapt because they've got the availability and the biomass available to them. And then each prey, yeah, as I said, each prey phylum is completely necessary for the survival of them. And if you look elsewhere across Africa, uh, that's not necessarily the case anymore. I did a little bit of work in Malawi and there's, unfortunately, there's not too many large mammals around or even small mammals and not many birds left. And you can imagine that, um, I mean, there probably were reptiles, but very hard to find. Uh, but that Marshall Eagle provisioning food to a chick would really struggle if those temperatures exceed those maximum dailies. So they're not able to then catch uh, sufficient food for those chicks so they can raise the chick, but you end up having a weaker chick that might have stress fractures in its feathers or uh, underdeveloped when it then fledges the nest. And particularly with all raptors, that initial uh, fledging period is probably the most important for them or the hardest part of their lives to get through the first two years. So yeah, if, they, if they're not getting sufficient food, um, likelihood is they might not survive the next two year period. All right, so there was a number of um, what are the interesting interactions that happened throughout the 2022 years. So that was my MSC in a nutshell there, but I want to get onto the interesting interactions here. So there is adult mortality and there is adult replacement. And hopefully there's enough birds out there that are floating around waiting to replace the, mortal the, the birds that died. 
But in this case, I was walking through the bush looking for a nest and I was heading to the nest. I actually just walked into the female who unfortunately had died for some reason. Um, might have been caught while it was then preying on something. Um, not quite sure. But anyway, she passed away and the, the adult male was sitting on the ridge line watching the female. So we could see him uh, 400, 500 meters away just watching us down on the bottom, which was really sad. And we got to the nest and unfortunately the chick then had died as well. So as I said, the male doesn't feed the female. So I don't know if it would happen, but if the chick is old enough to feed itself, that male can then bring food back to the nest, leave it there, and the chick will begin feeding after about 60 days it'll begin feeding itself. Before 60 days, it's completely reliant on the mother to then break up the food and hand it to him. Um, but I, I'm not sure, this chick here was very, very young, so it didn't make it through. Anyway, the territory is probably still active, so just waiting for another individual to, to come into the territory. And in this case, this, this one on the right-hand side was in Bachendal. And I first got there and, and saw that there was nice greenery on the nest, and I thought, oh, I'm gonna put the camera up, I'll put the camera up. And then I got back two weeks later and there was no more greenery and everything had just turned brown and the birds just disappeared and I couldn't understand why this had happened. Until about two months later I then took the camera down and got this picture here which was the first time that the two of them had been on the nest together. So this is now an adult male who's standing there looking at a sub-adult female. And there you can see the size difference. I, I'm not sure if he's too happy with the situation but I don't think he has a choice. Uh, she's moving in, and <laughs> they, <laughs> so they actually then started putting greenery on the nest, and it's part of a pair bonding thing that, that goes on for quite a long period until they have the nest um, sufficiently looked after. And I think next year they might give it a go, maybe try and have an egg, but obviously she's young, she has not done this before, and the likelihood of success is quite slim. So when you lose an adult, you might actually lose productivity from that ter the territory for the next two to three years. So it's a very long process for these birds to get back up and going again. So apart from that, there was also a couple of nest predation events, and oh, there goes my data. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's a real shame. Uh, so the first one happened in 2018 before, the, before I arrived there. There was a... Um, honey badger that, that climbed the nest tree at night and managed to kill the female and uh, I think there was an egg at that point so yeah got the nest but that was one of the first records of a honey badger doing this so all of, although this is not good for martial eagles it was also very interesting ecological interactions that might excuse me that might not have been recorded before um, there was no interactions of leopards killing marshals before 2022, but in that year we had these two plus another one in Kenya. So there was three interactions in one year, which was fascinating. And it just shows the, the benefits of camera traps. Um, these low density species that are very secretive, you can't sit and watch them all day long and they don't do what they're supposed to do if you are watching them. So camera traps really are invaluable to the, the work we do here. And uh, I guess for fantastic pictures, yeah, you couldn't ask for better. Um, so the top one on the right was up in Palabora, and that was actually a, I think it was a scavenging event where the f that's a young female uh, leopard who then followed uh, the adult marshal in, and the adult marshal had just brought a Franklin in, and 20 minutes later she climbed the nest and chased the female away, but also killed the chick and scavenged uh, the Franklin. So that might be a scavenging event, but. The bottom one's a big tomcat and that was definitely a predation event where he climbed at night and jumped up and managed to catch the female on the nest plus the chick on the nest, uh, which yeah, real shame but very, very interesting interactions. So another one, also Palabora, this nest on the left hand side, I don't know if any of you can really make out, on the bottom left hand corner is the head of a white back vulture. And this white-back vulture had started taking over this martial eagle nest. And I think it might be the chick who actually fledged from this nest two years, two years prior. And what, what happened there was the, the, the white-back vultures had been prepping the nest, ready to, then, ready to breed. And I think they were very, uh, well, very soon we're going to actually lay the egg. And then the next thing, we get one picture of this and nothing before and nothing after. And this just happened to be, I think, one of the one of three interactions where Marshall was killed 
a, a vulture. The other one was a hooded vulture as well as a um, white-headed vulture. But I, I arrived two weeks later and there was a vulture carcass underneath the nest completely eaten. And yeah, very interesting. So even the, the large birds are not safe uh, from, um, from marshals. They really want to kill everything. So. And that leads on to nest competition. So there are a lot of large raptors in, in uh, the low felts, all looking for large nests. And here we had an uh, interesting interaction where the female marshal would then start building the, we building the nest. Over a two week period she came in with fresh green leaf lining and kept on building the nest and putting leaf lining. And as she would leave you would see the white back arrive and just destroy exactly what she had done. And they did this for two weeks solid, back and forward, back and forward, until eventually I guess she needed to lay the egg. And at that point she laid on a pile of sticks with no nice soft leaf lining. She tried to then build a little bit of a cup where she could then um, incubate the egg from. Uh, but it wasn't big enough and it wasn't sufficient and I guess comfortable enough because there's a 50 day incubation period. So I guess you've got to be comfortable for 50 days. And within 10 days she abandoned the egg and she then left. And about 10 days later um, Mr. Mr. Pavoon arrived and had a nice meal on top of the nest. Uh, so again, interesting whether she would have made it through uh, the whole breeding season without that male baboon arriving, because I'm pretty sure the male probably would have chased her off or tried to catch her or eaten the egg. Um, I don't know if that would have happened or if she was able to defend it. They don't tend to defend their nest too well, actually. If I arrive there, they fly away. Uh, it's as simple as that. But the smaller birds, for instance, black sparrowhawks, you climb the nest and they dive bomb you back and forward and they fly at you. And you would assume it's very similar with these guys, but they just leave. And I think that's uh, maybe um, a, a strategy to keep yourself safe. Because if you're a very long-lived species, you're likely going to have, uh, let's say, 10 eggs throughout your lifespan. And if you lose this one, then let's try again next year. There's no rush to, to get it right, is, is my opinion. Otherwise, you should see them actually trying to defend their nests or putting their nests in trees are, that are inaccessible. Um, but this is not the case here. So, yeah, again, another interesting interaction there. And all of that in context. Um, so it seems that just based on the work that we've done over the last um, 12 years or so, that actually the population in Kruger seems to be doing pretty well and it's stable. Um, I think there's estimated to be roughly about 120 pairs throughout Kruger although we have very few and it is it's hard to find more. Um, but what actually might be happening is that populations outside of Kruger uh, are dwindling and there's obviously a lot of habitat fragmentation outside of Kruger as well as habitat loss and then loss of prey species. So there might have actually been influx of, of marshals um, moving into Kruger in the past and that's no longer happening but we're getting this um, what's a post-fledging dispersal uh, out of Kruger from these young birds. So although the population seems stable, what we did notice is that a few of these active nests that lost um, adult partners seem to be fulfilled by immature birds rather than adult birds. So it's a sign that there might be a bit of a weakness in the population if you've got uh, no adult birds floating around but only immature birds floating around. So those adults have already taken up uh, territories so uh, it's, uh, this is hearsay, this is me just spitballing here, but um, I think for now the population seems fairly stable. Um, yeah, the low reproductive success, as I said, we started with 24 nests that were all active and we whittled that down to six birds that actually fledged a chick that whole year. And uh, there was at least five mortalities uh, or loss of eggs throughout the period and yeah, um, just low reproductive success is obviously a, a major issue for them, but it might be natural. Again, you need to study these birds for the next 30 years to really get a good picture of their uh, trajectory because they're so long-lived um, and they breed so slowly. And then lastly, well, a better understanding of prey, prey composition. Again, they're poorly studied uh, because you can't sit at a nest and watch it all day and get a good idea of what they feed on. 
Um, so just getting an idea of what they actually do feed on uh, is important for creating management strategies um, and managing tracts of land for small mammals as well as large mammals as well as game birds um, to ensure that they do have sufficient prey available to them throughout the year. And then it is great to compare the, their diet with other areas like the Masai Mara uh, or the Karoo where there's obviously vastly different prey species in the Karoo um, and yeah, good to have a baseline of comparison. So at the moment they're actually using a lot of this data uh, to particularly the, the movement tracking data uh, to help guide uh, wind farm uh, renewable energy development. So basically they're using that data to see where eagles move throughout the landscape in relation to the climate and the temperature and then also in relation to the actual um, habitat quality or the drainage lines or wherever it may, may be along mountainsides so that you can then better um, uh, help developers position their wind farm in the, in the right places rather than in the wrong places. So the data all goes to a good place and is being used successfully and at the moment I think they're about to, to finish what's called Mira, um, the Marshall Eagle no, don't quote me on that one. I don't know. <laughs> but it's all going through the fits and there's a couple of very smart postdoctoral students working on it. So uh, basically, as I said, it's to help developers uh, highlight where they will likely come into contact with Marshall Eagle territories, where they're likely going to have high conflict areas and um, collision risks, and then better um, position your developments in the correct places. So it's being, this information is useful and is being used at the moment. And then, I guess, improves our climate change models for the future. Knowing how every species is uh, affected by climate change um, is important, and not just the marshals themselves. And hopefully this is useful for them. Top. And then, yeah, thanks very much to... I have to say thanks, I don't know how long that was, but thank you very much. Um, to all the game guards and section rangers and field rangers that I got to mission around Kruger with. Uh, it was a fantastic eight months in the bush and yeah all of these guys were fantastic brilliant on the point and um, didn't get me stampled no, trampled by a, an elephant or killed by a lion and yeah so they got me through safely and I appreciate all of them and then um, thanks very much to the Fitz uh, for for having me I guess um, I have to thank firstly Arjun Amar my supervisor who managed to get me uh, onto the project in the first place and I, I jumped at the opportunity to come back to Kruger to work here. And then to Meg Murgatroyd, who's part of Hawk Watch International. Um, and she uh, managed to organize uh, funding for me as well through ABAX Foundation. And then uh, thanks to Sandpox again for having me. And I, I have to say thanks to my social society, uh, the Plastered Penguins back in Cape Town as well. Appreciate uh, all those uh, social events. Um, and then, yeah. Uh, a, a meme just on uh, sometimes it's a rainy day and that for me was the write-up period and the analysis period but you know the field work was good was good fun and it's not always a rainy day and, and uh, it does get better so yeah I'm very very thrilled with the whole process and the MSC was great thank you I think let's give him another round of applause. Okay, question time. So I've just asked Kyle yeah, to just repeat your question so that the, the, the filming can, can understand what the questions are. Um, probably an opportunity to speculate, but what do you think is the selection pressure that leads to female eagles being so much larger than the males? So the question is what is the selection pressure that leads to females being larger than males? And I think it is that sexual sized dim niche dimorphism where they, they uh, allow females to hunt larger prey and males to hunt smaller prey so you've got a large amount of um, different prey species that you're able to hunt and particularly during the breeding season um, it allows males to go out throughout the beginning of the breeding season and hunt all the small things whilst the large things are then not over consumed the female can then go uh, throughout the later half of the breeding season 
and then a hunt. And so you're not diminishing your prey all by all at once, effectively. So yeah, niche size separation. Yeah. That's cool. I haven't thought of that. What's the lifespan? What's the lifespan of martial eagles? That's a good question. Uh, I don't think anyone really knows, uh, to be honest. I don't think there's a definitive lifespan, but I think they've been recorded upwards of 18 years, 19 years, just through the rings um, and, yeah, uh, color rings and saff rings. Um, but I, th I think they can go higher than that. Uh, I can't give you an, a definitive because obviously uh, they, they live different time periods if you have them in captivity or if you're seeing wild animals. Um, I'm going to go with, with 20 years around there, yeah. Yeah, in the nest, I saw only one egg. So do they only lay one egg? So there's only one, one egg in the nest. Uh, they only lay one egg at a time. Yeah. Actually, I think, yeah, not at a time. They only lay one egg per year. Uh, if they fail very early on, yeah. they might try and reattempt. But that would be failing in March time and then trying to reattempt by April, May time. Um, yeah. But if they fail again, that's it for the season <coughs> and they'll try again maybe next year. Mm. And the other thing you mentioned that um, you, your study only looked up to, you only studied up to Shingwezi and you didn't go further. Mm. Is there a reason for that? Or? They wanted to rein me in. <laughs> I wanted to do the whole park. Yeah, yeah. It's it's. Um, they've actually put out a paper more recently where they're looking at the effect or the benefits of using satellite tracking devices to monitor these uh, large distributed species. Um, and the information you can get from a satellite tracking device is maybe better than what we can get from monitoring nests. So it's going more technologically based now, field research. Um, and basically, they wanted to focus further down south where you know you were hitting all the areas rather than sparsely going through the whole of Kruger. Uh, so actually, up to Shingwezi, I did find one or two nests there, but I didn't put up cameras there. I tried to focus south of Palabora, basically. Yeah. Do you have an opinion on the elephant population in Kruger, knocking down the big trees that the um, larger raptors like the Marshall Eagle and Nesting? Okay, the question is, do I have an opinion about, <laughs> <laughs> about elephants knocking down trees in Kruger and the, the number of elephants in uh, the Kruger? I think I do have an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, maybe we have a beer afterwards. Uh, uh, I mean, there is competition throughout for large nesting trees. Um, even amongst the raptors, there's competition for them. Uh, I have to say they are able to breed in multiple trees and trees that look horrible, there's suddenly still a nest. So they are able to breed in large trees. Um, certain areas obviously are devoid of large trees, problematic, but um, yeah, if I say that's all based on elephant work, I don't know if it's all based on elephant work, but yeah. So following on from that, you said that there's marshals down in the Karoo, where presumably the trees aren't necessarily as big. But if there's still a healthy population... Yeah, so the question is, uh, there's marshals in the Karoo that are maybe breeding in trees that are not necessarily as big, but there's still a healthy population. So the Karoo is a bit of a conundrum where they didn't actually occur in the Karoo um, in the past. But obviously in the Karoo you find a lot of poplar trees and poplars were brought in. So they're using invasive tree species that are very tall as well as quite structurally sound and they're building nests in there. But the majority of uh, nests in the Karoo are actually on tall power line infrastructure. So they're using the big pylons to, to use that. So I've heard monitoring them in the Karoo is a breeze because you just go pylon to pylon and you just find them all the way down. Following on from that one, mm -hmm. in Bulgaria, when they replaced power lines, they left the old pylons up so that the birds could nest on the pylons. And then they obviously put new power lines and pylons up, but they left the old ones. Which means that they were obviously thinking, again, well, the birds are going to nest on the old ones. The birds have nested on the old ones. So maybe we just need to put 
pylons. More structures. Yeah, so, yeah, so the, the thought was that in, in Bulgaria they actually changed their power line infrastructure and left old infrastructure up, which then birds are then still using to, to breed on. Um, and then it goes the whole thought of were the birds actually meant to be there in the first place? And what are they feeding on and what is the impact of them and the environment in the Karoo? Uh, are they feeding on a small, small antelope in the Karoo or um, all the, the Cape Red rock rabbits who are all critically endangered in their own right? And yeah, so in, yeah, I don't know if it's yeah, ideal, but you find that much with the pied crows as well. If you look at any of the infrastructure in the Karoo, it's, it's all filled with pied crows. Um, my opinion is remove every pole. Yeah, get rid of them all. <laughs> um, have you seen a trend in their nest structure, or is it pretty stock standard, or have you found different materials in the nests in different areas where they have more access to different stuff? Uh, the, have I seen a trend in the different nest material that's used in different structures uh, around the park, I guess? Um, so what's, it's, it's nice to, well, as you drive around, you're seeing nests in a tree, and there's a good way to figure out what uses it. I guess firstly by size, the, the thing is ginormous compared to, let's say, a Wahlberg's eagle nest is much smaller, or a tawny eagle's nest is big, but it's right at the top of a canopy, whereas this is nicely in a large... Uh, in a large fork in the tree. Uh, the nest size material, so the actual branches that they bring in are incredibly large compared to little twigs. So you're finding large branches and that's a, a dead giveaway. Um, sometimes you get to a nest and you're not sure if the nest is actually active and you see there's dead material but there's one little green leaf sitting in the middle of the tree. And it's understandable if, you're, if it's in a mapani tree and you see a mapani leaf on the nest then not so much. Uh, it could be that the, the leaf has fallen. But when you're in a knob thorn and you find a mapani leaf, then I guess it didn't just float there. So it must be. Um, in this regards, I don't know about marshals using particular leaf material for any properties or reasons. Uh, some of them were using uh, those tree fuchsia uh, leaves, which I guess are very soft. That nest was particularly soft. But she was a young female, and maybe that was what was available to her. Um, Often you'll find just Mapani leaves in the Mapani region, and yeah, it's dependent on where you are. But on another case, uh, in the Western Cape, you have black sparrowhawks who have these nests that they, they use eucalyptus leaves, and they're pulling eucalyptus leaves, putting it in the nest. And eucalyptus leaves and that oil that's in eucalyptus oil is uh, beneficial for the nest, and it's like an antibacterial, antimicrobial uh, deterrent, effectively. So it has some benefit, but I don't know on the marshals whether that's the case at all. Yeah, um, you mentioned that uh, if a partner dies, um, a juvenile martial eagle would you know, come to replace the partner that died. But, and you also mentioned that that is linked to the decline of the population. Mm -hmm. And did, you, did your study look at uh, what was the reason why the juvenile martial eagles were not more or less like playing the role, whether whether it's unable to mate, whether they are unable to feed the young, mm. or whether they are unable to go in a hunt or prey? Uh, what what was the reason? Okay, so um, the question was if juvenile martial eagles are able to actually hunt and provision food uh, if they come into a new territory and I did mention that they uh, that there are a lot more juveniles taking over territories now um, it, it's not that they can't hunt I, I have to say and I'm sorry if I didn't say this that it can take upwards of five years for a juvenile to reach full sexual maturity. So any bird that makes it to two years already is fully capable of hunting and surviving by itself. It, it's more a proxy for how the population is doing when I'm seeing a lot more juveniles taking over rather than adults. So the, the, the birds themselves are fully capable of hunting and provisioning and holding a territory um, but obviously a mature bird uh, would either be more successful at holding the territory uh, or defending the territory and then producing chicks 
uh, immediately as opposed to maybe in the next two or three years time um, yeah so uh, I think the follow-on of what you were saying was um, they did a study initially uh, based on tracking movements of juveniles where those mo the juveniles were then fledging and leaving Kruger and the mortality rate of the juveniles was quite high once they left Kruger and they got into non-protected areas uh, particularly Mozambique inside that first year I think they lost two birds in Mozambique and then another one outside South Africa. So there is a higher mortality in that first year. But once they reach the more sub-adult region, they, they're actually quite successful. Ta. And my last question, sorry. <laughs> Let's go. You mentioned that you did uh, some studies in Malawi. Mm. Was that linked to your Kruger study? Or? No, it wasn't, not at all. Uh, but while we were there, we were looking for, for eagles and we found two pairs. So there were birds around, but um, yeah, very, very limited numbers. Mm. So, sorry, I, yeah, I, I did some work in Malawi and we're asking if that's linked to my Kruger study at all. That's it. Um, um, so I look for martial tests in the Karoo. Yeah? Not quite as easy as <laughs> oh, okay. So, it, what did it look like a fully? Uh, there was a martial eagle nest in the Karoo, and there was a, a, a skeleton of a, this chick underneath the nest. Um, there's, I guess, there's multiple reasons. Uh, the bird can also fall. There's high winds. That's a very high nest. Falls off the nest and injures itself below. And it, I, I often relate them to like race cars, where they're so finely tuned that any little bit of a, a problem on their wings, in particular puts them out of action. If they can't fly, they can't catch, they starve to death. So if there's any kind of injury after a, a big fall, uh, that's problematic, likely a fall. Um, also, there is electrocutions, but not typically on the large infrastructure because those power, the, the actual cables are too far spread. Uh, so it's probably not electrocution. Um, I don't know if there's any incidents of poisoning, um, but I, I doubt that the, the marshes don't tend to scavenge, so likely not that. Uh, people shoot at marshals as well, uh, particularly in the Karoo. They obviously have a bad reputation for feeding on little lambs, and that's not good in the Karoo. So, yeah, I've, I've heard horror stories of that side of it as well. Um, yeah, it's, it's not unusual for chicks to die at the nest. It, I mean, uh, we had three there that also, yeah. That's my, my opinion there. Yeah. Um, you said that the birds lay their eggs more means they're. Sorry? You said that the marshal eagles lay their eggs March or April. Mm -hmm. Which means they're feeding mostly in winter. Is that because the prey is more visible in the short grass of the winter and the, the brown? Um, and it's hotter, so. <laughs> yeah, so the, the marshals um, lay their eggs in March, April, and, and even later, uh, March, April. And it, does it help them find prey? Uh, earlier on or later in the middle of winter season. Um, they, they can go later on. I think the, the last one of ours laid in June. So d then it was, I guess, foraging in, in summertime. I guess it, it's helpful to have a um, easier foraging if there are birds out in the open. And the particular birds will be warming themselves in the morning. So that's, uh, but I don't know if I can say that that's why they, they lay there. I think it might be more related to once the chick has now fledged the nest, the chick must start surviving by itself. And by the time it fledges the nest, it's now springtime, all the babies are coming out, and there's probably going to be a lot more prey, particularly in the small mammal or medium mammal range of baby impalas coming out. And those adults are able to provide a lot more food to a much hungrier chick. Um, yeah. And, and as well, when the chicks start catching, you have um, <coughs> young animals that are not adept to staying alive. So it's easier for chicks to then hunt and catch food. It might be that way around. Yeah. You said that the martial eagles are going to be longer lifespan. Is that lifespan than the other eagles? Uh, so does martial eagles have a longer lifespan than other eagles or is it all relative? 
Um, I think the smaller the bird, generally the, the, the shorter the lifespan, but again we've had black sparrow hawks that did show that they led 18 years uh, in Cape Town area, so it's, I might be talking a bunch of baloney here. <laughs> Um, I, I, I can't give you an, an upper age limit of how long marshals live, but as far as I think the records have gone in the wild, I think we've been finding birds that are ringed that are about 20 years old. So they might go longer than that. The other complication is when you catch an adult to fit it with a ring and a satellite tracker, you're catching a bird that is five plus years old. You have no idea if it's actually 15 plus years old. So it's all relative of five, and we haven't put enough rings on young birds that have then survived for the last, I mean, 20 years. I've only been doing it for a couple of years, so I wouldn't have a, have a clue. So that's what I'm saying. It's, it's a, such a long-term project that if you put chicks, uh, rings on chicks now, you might only be seeing them in 30 years' time, but you won't know because you're probably not around for it. Um, yeah. I, no, no, sorry, not you. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> My apologies. Right, yeah. Is that it? One more, yeah? The, the slide you had on earlier of the ring of territories, and you yeah. said you don't know there's nothing in the middle because you didn't go there. When no, the birds I, actually leave a space, you know <coughs> the birds never came out of the territory that you show. Mm. Because mm. would they fly into here to pick up food and then come back? Or would they leave the <coughs> Because if you were in here, mm. you couldn't go anywhere because there's a territory and the other birds are going to... Yeah. Uh, so, well. is there potentially a territory in the middle or is it vacant and will the birds then use that vacant piece of land to then forage? And uh, I think the answer is that, as I said, it's such a massive block. Uh, there's one nest here, which I did go to and there was a white-backed vulture sitting on the nest. So it could have been a martial nest before, it's then used by a vulture that year. I don't know, but just for that one year, I could only say that it's, it's vacant. Um, but I, in all likelihood, there is a territory there. Um, I just have not found the nest. Um, the other, I think there was, so any of you have been to Skakuza, there's Matakanyana Mountain, that big granite mountain here. And I think there was a, a nest that I went to here that had fallen over, they found on the aerial survey. So there was a nest. I got there and had fallen over. And so, yeah, the, the territory's... <laughs> yeah, um, so the territory is active. And I, I think, I mean, this is a, a nice pretty picture, per se, of having a central nest with a nice hundred, uh, five kilometer radius around it. Um, but in theory, that nest can actually be uh, two kilometers to the side of the territory. And they're actually foraging a lot further back that way. Uh, then, so they're closer to their northern boundary. Um, but I don't know that, I just put a pendant, and they definitely, I mean, you can see it's nicely delineated. These guys would be problematic, but both nests were active, but they have all the Sabi River, and then that was uh, Green A3 over there, who probably used up until about, uh, up until about there. So this territory extends a lot further down south. So it's not the perfect, the, the perfect fit, but it helps you, as, as someone looking for nests, it helps you uh, find. If you look at something like a, a Wahlberg's eagle, if you find one nest, you go three kilometers that way, you find the next nest, three kilometers that way, it is like bang on three kilometer, and that's ideal, whereas this is needle and haystack stuff. Is this based on breeding season data or throughout the year? I think his tracks there were breeding season data. Okay, so they might expand outside the breeding season. As well. Thank you. That's why we have bird people here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, Carl's saying is the tracks based on breeding season data or outside of breeding season data. And obviously, breeding season data, they are confined to around the nest to bring as much food back as possible. But they do tend to, to wander, actually. Um, noticed in Palabora, there would be a female that would just go walk about an extra 20, 30 kilometers out of range over other territories. But you can see via the, the, t the t or satellite tracking uh, altitude that she's way up there and just traveling over and not actually foraging in that other territory because they are incredibly territorial. I, I heard something about the, most of the um, deaths that occur is, is from post-fighting. And those talons are, I showed one picture there, it's almost the size of the knife there. So yeah, uh, you get a puncture wound from one of that and it might be a bit problematic.
Five kilometer radius, 100 kilometers squared. 100 kilometers squared, yeah. Did you observe them fighting over territory? Um, did I observe birds fighting over territories? No, I mean uh, the marshals. Yeah, yeah. Did I observe the marshals fighting over territories? No, I did not. No, I was only there for eight months, but the project has been going for a long time. But I didn't, I didn't observe that. No. Cool. So my last question. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Is that territorial? Mm -hmm. Is that male and female? They're monogamous. They breed together so and uh, look after the territory will, together, yes. The male will try and kick a female out and the female will try and kick another male. Hmm. I'm actually not sure. So the question is whether a male would kick another male out of the territory and if a female would kick another female out. Um, my guess is that both individuals will try to kick an individual out of the territory because they're working together to protect their own territory. Uh, but um, obviously when it comes to a female entering the territory, that male's really going to struggle to try and push a large female out. So then it's, it's kind of reliant on the dominant female to actually get involved as well. And then in that case, both of them. But if a male entered and a male was one-on-one, -on -one, it would likely just push the other male out of the territory. Yeah. Or try to. Try to. Oh, the, I don't know about um, taking over territories from active breeding um, males, because obviously you, the, the female also doesn't want a new partner that they then have to start over from scratch and it might waste time. I think they want to keep their territory to themselves and, and hold it for as long as possible. Hmm. So the the marsh uh, the marshals taking chickens in the community lands and is there any history of marshals taking dogs? Um, I can find out for you. I think I mean Stratton Stratton Hatfield up in Kenya has a lot more of those kind of issues. Um, I know we've got on the periphery of Kruger, but I only had one bird that was monitored on the nest, so I have no idea if, if any dog ever came in. But Stratton, I think, may have, may have seen a dog or two arrive on the nest. And I've heard from more like, more like crowned eagles, dogs are more common on nests. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll find out for you. I'm not quite sure that. Hmm. <coughs> Thank you. Oh.